So good morning, and uh, I was saying to the first four folks in the room, I think you should all get an award for navigating to this location. You've got to the heart of the labyrinth, and I hope it was worth your while. And uh, I appreciate you being with us this morning and my opportunity to speak with you. So having gone back through my material just recently in preparation for presenting here today, I'm beginning to think maybe this should have been called What Can EIM Do To You? because we're going to take a quick gallop across quite a complex landscape and look at many of the uh, components that go into the development of an enterprise information management function for an organization. And I'm going to try and give you more a list of takeaways of things you might want to consider about a program that you may have or a program you may be planning. So just very quickly, I want to acknowledge that I'm privileged to be in the Bank of America environment it's a great place because we have a wide franchise of offering all of the financial services products necessary for consumers, small businesses, and commercial enterprises around the globe. We function in 156 countries as of the end of 2011 um, and have a full service franchise. So it's a very challenging and complex environment. We're around a quarter million employees and uh, have uh, the opportunity to tackle almost every problem you can think of in the data management space based on that profile. And uh, I appreciate Sandy's introduction. The main thing is I hope I bring sufficient depth of experience to this conversation to be of value to you. So before we get started, um, how many folks in the room have a uh, component in your organization that you would view as an enterprise information management or data management capability? So that's about half of the folks here. Um, could one or two of you give me maybe just a quick insight into what you think the key focus areas of your organization is and what problem space it's most focused on solving? I, I saw you raise your hand, sir. The, yeah, the environment that we have is pretty complex, and uh, information management is built across different areas. So we have some business components that look at data from the business consumption standpoint. <clears throat> we have a group that's standing up uh, governance and metadata, data quality management, um, all being a foundation for master data management initiatives that are starting to develop forward. So you've got multiple areas of focus within that group. Yes. Yeah. Um, someone over here, I think, raised their hand. Did you, ma'am? No? Yes? Yeah, we're, um, our biggest challenge right now is we're trying to come up with an enterprise data strategy. Uh, we have, you know, great sources of truth for our business data and the information domains. Um, yeah, but for instance, we have, uh, you know, we work with healthcare, so we have 22 providers that have wow. tried to collapse down into some kind of source of truth for that. Mm -hmm. Because they, they, they're not a specific business. Right. right. So a lot, of people, a lot of organizations in this one is similar. You know, they look at things across the enterprise, who's going to be paid for it, what business say. Right. Um, and that's, that's probably one of our biggest challenges. Yeah. Well, and I, I apologize, I probably can't solve that for you here, and I certainly can't give you the funding. Um, if I could, I, I would take it back with me to solve my problems. <laughs> but. Um, I, I hope what we might do is give you some points you can factor in and consider, but just out of those two quick vignettes, what that shows us is there's different areas of focus and emphasis within two groups that sound similar and might be perceived to have the same function. So just as context, are there other folks in the room who think that their organizations might be moving towards setting up these kinds of groups in, in your organizations? Because if so, hopefully this material will give you something to use to help guide as you do that. Because my goal is to talk about the drivers and objectives of an information uh, management organization um, and give you some considerations and then look at 
what the, might be some of those benefits. Um, I realized in re-reviewing my ter material, I have committed the fallacy of putting too much, and I've put you know a quart into a pint pot. So we're going to go quite quickly. Hopefully, that means it won't get boring. Um, so what is EIM, and why do we care? Um, what, what I believe we're looking at is the emergence of the significance of information and data as a corporate asset and an asset that should be used to help fulfill the mandate of the organizations that we work for. So um, enterprise information management is the response to trying to provide a location that gives a custodial home to this crucial asset, but it's all very emergent, very nascent and we're struggling to clarify how do we really do that and what does it really mean. Um, so this is going to illustrate that this is a complex space and we have lack of clarity about it. But what are some of the things we should be considering as we look at tackling to answer the question, what is EIM and what can it do for each of you? Um, so I'm going to do the thing that being a, a data model of by birth and, and origin and orientation, um, after I got over being an arts graduate, um, unlike most people in this industry. Um, we, we're fascinated with our words and definitions, and the fact that I went to the Oxford Dictionaries is not because I have English roots, it's because actually these definitions were much easier to share than Merriam-Webster, who is where I usually go for my definitional references. Enterprise. Um, so the blue highlights are the, the phrases I think are significant to this conversation. A project or undertaking, especially, and I do like this, a bold or complex one. So therefore, we are going forth boldly to tackle the complexity, and that is actually completely true. Um, so that's not usually the context, I think, that we use the word enterprise in when we're talking about enterprise information management. It's usually more in the context of being a business or a company, talking about wanting to do something at the more overarching level rather than the subunit level. So information, what is information? Well, we could probably spend the whole day on that, but we won't. Um, and the other one I love is what's data and what's information and why do we have information practices which always have data labels on them. And, but information, facts provided or learned about something or someone, that's the generic use in the, in the everyday world. Um, a second one which actually is going to get more significant to us as data and information professionals is that it's what's conveyed or represented by a particular arrangement or sequence of things. So a very good example of this is the genome. The elements of information when you analyze the DNA, there is actual meaning obviously in the sequencing of the genome, not just in the information that is in that. So that's something that over time is probably going to get more pertinent to many of us that it's not just the element of information, but the sequence can be important. Again, not our primary focus right now, probably the third definition, data is stored, processed, or transmitted by a computer. Um, and what that means, which is implied but not stated by that definition, is it's in a digital form. So there's some thoughts about enterprise and information and management the process of dealing with or controlling things or people. Wouldn't it be great if we can control our data? I thought it was wonderful. The gentleman at the back actually knows he has eight domains of information. I wish I knew how many we had. <laughs> so I, I was pleased. Now some of that is to some degree probably an arbitrary classification and you probably have boundaries that you have discussions about but you are at least put, beginning to put a framework for controlling your information in place. Um, the people managing a company or an organization obviously are also called the management, and those are the people we're always trying to deal with to get money from, right? Um, so that, that, that's another context, and um, management as um, a, a more adverbial form, the responsibility for and control of a company or organization. So let's put all of this together and do the cheerleader thing and say, you know, give me an E, give me an I, give me an M. And we are the cheerleaders for data in our organizations if we're looking at the information practice and establishing the um, enterprise information management function. And what we get is that traditionally EIM is really just dealing with data for the total company. 
I think that's what people transcribe that to mean when someone comes up and says, oh, I work for EIM. Oh, so you're busy trying to organize the data for the company. And we're going to look at how true is that and what are the nuances that that can mean. But for right now, um, I think that the, the more common interpretation is what's bolded in blue. But as I said at the beginning when we were looking at the definition of enterprise, I do think that we are doing something which has a very challenging component to it and that we are going into a certain degree of uncharted territory and therefore there is a risk factor to it because I don't think anyone can really tell us what are our problem space entirely and how to tackle and organize it. So, um, we, we would take enterprise as the scope statement to mean we're dealing with the whole asset base of the company. Our subject um, over time is going to expand and I think that's what's significant about that definition of information. Right now we've tended to constrain it to the data definition but we know the pressure's out there and that's definitely current in the, in, in the industry as we come to a conference like this, we're hearing about big data, we're hearing about unstructured data. What is NoSQL? And I mean, let's remember, NoSQL isn't no SQL. it's not only SQL. So we're not throwing anything out or ceasing to have to worry about things we've had before. It's additive, and it's not only. So it's not only data, it's going to move up this column, and we're going to need to be concerned as our management and our businesses are with information in the broader sense. And then we are right now trying to get our arms around controlling the things or people. Well, it's actually the data that we're trying to control as the subject in this context. Um, but we do have to interact with management in the broader context, but that's probably a less challenging permutation column on, on the process end of this. So all I want to suggest here is in the, in the classic matrix sense, there's a lot of permutations and just be thinking about that a little bit. So what does EIM really mean? Um, I think that the scope is saying that somewhere we're working to integrate data and information where it crosses boundaries. And it may be at the enterprise scope but there are also uses of the word enterprise, particularly in our industry. You know, we have enterprise class software, and you look at it and find that, yeah, it can handle two or three groups reasonably well, but if I go to Bank of America, where if we look at the total number of registrable legal entities within the corporation, I believe we're up to 8,000. Um, and then if I look at us from a divisional perspective, we've got um, 10 major divisions. Um, if I looked at a line of business or product perspective, I, I don't know the counts, but it's multiples of that. So what do I mean when I say enterprise? And one of the things that needs to be thought about as you talk about enterprise information management is what is your scope? Is it really enterprise or is it divisional or is it some combination of lines of business or groups with common concern? What is your subject? We looked at the earlier definition and said, right now, it tends to be presumed to be that which we're managing within our computing capability today, the digitized assets. Within that, we've got structured and unstructured. And that you know, open faucet that's, pouring, faucet that's pouring in, or the fire hose, of the social, the web, the big data. What are we doing with all of this? Is it part of our mandate? Um, if so, where does it fit? And what's the relationship? Um, and then the next boundary, which is coming up for us as a financial services institution is, what about all that paper? You know, I mean, it's really nice to be able to put little green leaves beside things you put out for the media saying we're eco-friendly and we don't use paper unnecessarily. But how do you do that when you're writing millions of mortgages, when uh, signature cards and uh, titles of property and collateral are still actual physical paper assets. Um, we have actually managed to digitize the, rec re the record keeping for stocks and bonds. That was happening back in the 80s. Um, but what about all that other paper? And, and I mean, let's not even talk about people's desks and files and those of us who are more than 30 years old and still write things down and put them into folders. 
physical folders. Um, is that part of the scope of the information that should be being managed by enterprise information management? It's got commonality um, with the digital data. Um, so that's another question, the whole records management space. And then finally, what about internal versus external data? Uh, most organizations have to buy external data uh, using it for codification, for compliance with ISO criteria or United States post office addresses and so forth. Who's got the responsibility for that? And does that fall under the mandate of enterprise information? Or is that something that you're going to try and find somewhere else in the organization for it to be managed? And then finally, um, like that wasn't adding us enough headaches and things to think about. Um, what is going to be the scope of the processes you're concerned about? Are they the traditional data management capabilities of you know, identifying, describing, locating, and storing your data? Are they um, dealing with concerns like archiving, retrieval, and destruction of data? Um, this is becoming enormous, particularly as we do the more enormous big data. So now we have an enormous, enormous problem. Most of us haven't <coughs> dealt well with uh, archival and destruction of legacy data. And now, you know, we're trying to open up the warehouse, maybe literally, maybe metaphorically, and cram more in. Um, the common business language. Anybody here got a common business language in their organization? No. And how long have we been working on that one? Or oh, CBL, which will solve all our problems. But we still know. I, I, I keep work, trying to work out, is this just an allure of the, you know, chimera on the horizon that I'm chasing, or can we really do a common business language? But if we are to get integration of meaning, if not standardization of meaning, it will have to be under the auspices of some centralized kind of organization. Um, I think uh, the gentleman over here referenced that some of the analytic and warehousing function in his organization is seen to be under the enterprise information management function. And that tends to then bleed over into analytic support and provisioning and delivery of the results. And then actually both folks who did share with us that they have these organizations did reference data governance. And that's probably right now the most unifying process that EIM does. But it's certainly not uh, the only thing that can be in consideration. And this is not meant to be a comprehensive list. This is just some sampling for you to think about. What is it that your organization needs to be doing? And one of the ways to, to work that out is to look at what are your objectives for your organization. There can be many reasons that an enterprise information management function gets stood up in a given corporation. And so I've tried to select what I think are probably the most frequently presenting instances and um, give you a sense of why it's important to understand what your presenting problem is, because based on that, your response to it of what is the focus and mandate for your organization is different and maybe actually significantly different. Now, these are not um, completely orthogonal to each other. Definitely, if I'm solving the second problem, there's data everywhere, but I can't find or use it successfully. If that's the reason my management believes I should set up and, and deliver a more coordinated service for my data, I'm probably going to end up with a, with a pretty good metadata program. And by doing that, I'm going to help with things like um, the managing business change, the uh, fifth entry around here, that I'm going to be able to have that metadata and use that to help me with impact analysis and maybe start building data lineage understanding. And that will be a contributing uh, element to the solution of a different problem. So they're not unrelated, but be very clear about what is the problem or problems that are being addressed by your organization establishment and make sure that you are focused around solving that problem and understand the relationship between the activities that you may have in scope for your enterprise information management solution. Again, you may have a mature organization that's been in place for a few years, but it's worth coming back and rechecking, are you still on the same mandate as you started with? If you've solved the problem about where's my data and I've got my metadata solution constructed, 
then what is it that I'm doing now? Am I looking to get operational excellence by using that knowledge to eliminate data errors and improve my system reliability, for instance, so that I'm improving customer service and meeting service levels? So it's worth thinking about this in the first place. It's also worth doing a health check against this on a periodic basis. I think John Ladley, who was speaking just earlier, um, in an article he wrote, suggested do a yearly checkup. It's kind of like, you know, go see the doctor, have your blood pressure taken, make sure you're still on track. And to the point of the significance of these objectives, what you do with your people, technology, and process, and what metrics are relevant to addressing your solution will vary based on what is the scope that you are resolving with your focus for the enterprise information management capability here. So that would mean that if you are addressing the need for data governance, you're going to want program managers and ideally folks with experience in data governance, obviously. Um, your tooling is going to be about workflow support and the repositories to manage the artifacts required for governance, your, your issues, your portfolios of assets, and so forth. Um, and your processes will be addressing issue identification, mediation, review, and resolution. That's quite a different set, and your metrics around compliance tracking are going to be different than if your focus is on consolidating your analytics. If that's what you're doing, you're going to have program managers, you're also going to have technical people supporting your data warehouse and BI capability, but some of your key assets are going to be people in the analysts and quant area, or maybe even now, those new, uh, new breed data scientists. Um, and you, so the skill set you're looking for to staff that is quite different. The technology is different. Your processes will be about how do I receive requests for analyses to be done by this group, uh, prioritize and, and design the solutions for those, and deliver the responses. Um, and probably your metric will be around cost reduction. What progress am I making in actually streamlining this environment? So this is just a very simple um, contrasting of what is the difference and why it's important that you think about what am I trying to do with this enterprise information management organization. Um, so now let's drill back in a little bit into things, some of the, the points that were brought up in what are the, your considerations around the enterprise information management solution. Um, I touched on the fact that I think we use the term enterprise to mean I'm going to be crossing at least one or more divisional boundary between lines of business, divisions, um, organizational boundaries, or maybe I'm going company wide. And as I do that, um, I'm going to have different scopes of problems and challenges and different cultural issues that I need to be addressing. And what am I trying to do when I um, am delivering my solutions is probably trying to get to common facilities and integration tools, but I need to have a clear view of who's going to be involved from an organizational perspective when I talk about EIM. Um, is there anybody in the room who has an enterprise management, data management type function that is actually not fully company-wide? It's more at a divisional or uh, line of business integration level. Yeah, so I mean, even today, that, that's true. And that, that can be very valuable because that's where you can seed and develop the capability to then get the practices to expand out. So there's absolutely uh, a lot of validity in taking that approach, and I talked to that just a little bit later on about how do I scope dealing with all of these variables so that I can actually survive and have some hope of success. But the other thing to consider, no matter what your scope is, whether it's company-wide down to just a few groups getting together trying to share and leverage common practices and share the cost of putting in place some of these enterprise information management functions, you need to look at the culture of your company. Um, and you can get a sense of your corporate culture by looking at how other processes are delivered, like your system de development lifecycle methodology, your budgeting processes. Are they uniform and unified across your company? Or is there a, a allowances for variation and autonomy? That's giving you a hint about your company culture. Um, 
how is your technology provisioned? Is the one place that everybody goes if they need a server? Or can you have multiple avenues to get to procurement? And do you have one procurement point, or do you have many? That's another indicator about the uh, ethos of your company and how centralized it is or decentralized. Um, do you consolidate your portfolio of projects? Um, those kinds of questions. And so an example of this is General Electric, at least uh, four or five years ago, I know, had explicitly made the decision to not integrate at the top of the house as General Electric. They run as separate divisions. And each division in this example would have its own EIM. And they might be completely different. I'm not sure what GE's um, actual division names are, probably like, you know, power generation and, and, and delivery and uh, finance. They, they do not try to have anything in common, and that is an explicit uh, company and cultural decision. So be aware of those things. The other thing I just wanted to say quickly is that um, having developed this presentation, I was working in my own company um, just last month and had the realization that as an enterprise information architect, I sit at the place that I'm supposed to try and influence activity across the whole company in the data and information management space at Bank of America. So of course we have the, the light bulb, the you know, recurring 20 year old light bulb of, well let's integrate with the SDLC and that way our architectural guidance and our data standards will get brought in to every project. Well what did we realize? And I actually helped it, developing this to come to speak to you helped me realize Bank of America does not have a unified systems development life cycle. So let's not spend the time trying to integrate into the SDLC because there isn't one SDLC, there are probably 10. So if I don't want to fragment my effort, I need to think of a different approach and strategy. So that was a cultural aha moment actually just for myself. Um, but based on that, think about which of these models, centralized, collaborative, autonomous, or cloned, might help you best deliver your enterprise information management function. Um, these, there are other analyses and, and words for talking about these forms of um, organization, but you know, centralized, obviously, we all do it the same, collaborative, um, we, we cooperate regionally based on an agreement to share common capability. Autonomous, don't bother me, I've got my own things and I'm busy. Um, uh, when I worked at First Union, we went through a wonderful phase where our CEO incented everybody to be entrepreneurial, which was okay from the financial revenue perspective because it was like, if you can make money, go ahead. But what that leads to, obviously, from the enterprise perspective is sub-optimization um, at the enterprise level because everybody's making little unified business cases down at the granular level. And so that's your more autonomous model. And then the cloned. Let's get together and have a group, and this is probably more where I am at Bank of America, where we aim to promote a standard model, common infrastructure, but we allow for variability of deployment. Um, so this is an example of, did I miss a slide? No, okay of what a federated model for delivering um, the um, enterprise information management function might look like and why you might need to consider what kind of grouping you are dealing with. Um, and, and as I said, for us at Bank of America, we're more or less looking at that cloned model where we try to deliver value-add artifacts that are worth our colleagues who operate. We have what are known as business technology groups and CIOs for each of our divisions, and they then can choose to adopt and embrace what we're promoting. We are also, through our um, enterprise information management role, which is now called enterprise data management, I believe, um, working to, and have just got in place for the bank, an enterprise data management policy and six related standards that say that the organization need, has to, for certain, categories of information and in certain situations deliver to these standards. So we are doing both the, um, you know, persuade with nice goodies and trying to enforce for the critical stuff. And in our environment, that's being driven by our need to be responsive to regulatory and com compliance pressures. 
So different ag groupings of this may occur, but in the federated model, it's that collaborative across, but uh, with uh, some coordinated uh, guidance from the center. Um, we've looked at what will EIM manage, and I've talked about some of these aspects. Um, what drives the fact that we need to keep expanding the scope of what we deal with is not just the fact that there's more data out there, it's the fact that there's co common characteristics of problems associated with those artifacts. Um, whether you're dealing with records management, with big data, data from the social space, or with your traditional structured data, you've got privacy issues, you've got security issues, you've got accessibility concerns, um, you've got life cycle management um, s considerations. So if those things are common, why wouldn't you want to try and use consistent solutions around them? And that's where there's going to need to be some thinking done about how much can you take on right now versus where can I be leveraging what could work well across more asset subclassifications as I'm rolling out this capability. Um, so that, that's driving us, for instance, at Bank of America, we are looking at combining records management in with the considerations of our more standard database-based um, assets in, in our um, work now. Any questions? I'm sorry, I'm as I said, I'm galloping. Yes, ma'am. Well, that, that would be one of these common considerations, which is actually um, my, my comment just very pertinent. Um, one of the reasons that we're looking at combining records management into our more structured methodology space around information management is the very thing that we are working on an archival retrieval and destruction policy. And that grew out of a records management initiative which started about four years ago at Bank of America. So we've been looking for products and tools that will help us with that and realize that they are not just um, isolated to that space. So that is part of our, our concern and our footprint and one of the drivers of expanding the scope of what we're dealing with. Yes? We, we, we're somewhat just at the beginning of our maturity uh, path in some of these areas. Um, one example I would cite, <coughs> excuse me, is that we um, have done some work around uh, developing guidelines on how to do data quality controls. And we have two of our groups which have looked at the deliverables that were developed by the enterprise group and said, this is helpful to me, come and talk to me about how I can use this to improve my data quality processes. So it would be something of that nature where we're trying to build value-add artifacts that our partners in the operational space may not have the time and capacity to drill into and put together something like how to do controls on data quality um, and, and how to, uh, what products might help with that. Um, so that we've got more powerful solutions and that can be um, helpful to our business technology groups <coughs> to solve that problem <coughs> Excuse me, more rapidly than if they didn't have that resource available. So we haven't got very far with the, the, with the carrots, um, but we're working on making more and trying to look at how to market those. Yes, sir? You mentioned that you have multiple CIOs Not yet, but we're working on it. We've actually been very privileged. Um, late last year, um, our company had recognized that having a chief data officer would be valuable. And uh, we had had a, someone in an um, interim role for about 10 months uh, through 2010, 2011 in that role. Um, at the end of 2011, we actually hired John Bottega, and he is now our chief data officer, and he is reporting to our enterprise CIO 
um, and is striving to bring much more accountability and executive awareness of this space and problem. And our enterprise information management organization is reporting into him. John Bottega comes to us. He was the um, CDO for City and then did about two and a half years with the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and helped draft components of the implementation of the Dodd-Frank Act. So um, we're very privileged and delighted to have him with us. It's giving us, as the information professionals in Bank of America, much more visibility and um, uh, ability to influence. Um, it's also uh, viewed very positively by our regulators that we've got that kind of depth and experience on board to help us with some of our data issues, which are definitely recognized as being a concern. Um, we looked briefly, so I'm, I'm going to move on, um, so I hopefully don't run over. Um, we looked briefly at data management responsibilities. Um, and again, <coughs> this is only widening. I think this is one of the challenges. That there was a time when it was reasonably easy to say, well, what is required to manage my data? <coughs> what I'm seeing now and this is happening even in my own organization, is we're starting to specialize. Um, I don't know as much about data quality as my colleague who leads that practice. I don't know <clears throat> as much about data provisioning and some of the controls and lineage issues associated with that as my colleague who leads that practice. Um, I probably have more depth and strength in the data modeling space and model management than the majority of my other colleagues. So we're starting to specialize. And I think that's going to continue because we're developing more refined ways of addressing the problem space. We're seeing more tooling and we're resolving more elements of the problem. So that's <coughs> requiring us to become more sophisticated in our response to the problems. What that means is that selecting what you're focusing on to do it well is going to be important and you're going to need be, to be considering the skills and the staffing as well as the tooling and technology that you need to support doing this. I don't think there's a one size fits all, I can just do X and I'll have data management anymore. Um, probably never really was, but I think we used to think we could. Um, so uh, again, as we recognize information as an asset, the charter of VIM will only expand. Um, <clears throat> So you have to be careful because people want to throw everything into the rag bag of EIM. Oh gosh, finally, someone. Um, make sure I've got good reference data. I've got MDM problems. Um, I, I, I want better data quality at this interface. Oh, I'll just give it to EIM, right? Oh, and by the way, just make sure it's all governed. We have no issues. And I want a dashboard at the CEO level um, and bring a report to the board once a month. OK, sure, on that. Um, it, 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 it's too easy to, to want to bring all of that there. So you're going to need to have clarity of focus so you can do the few things that you are focused on successfully, which is the value of choosing a smaller footprint to get started with. Um, and then there's the whole question of, well, and who owns this stuff anyway? You know, we all say it's a business asset, but then you need to look at who's got the responsibility in your corporation, even if it's a custodial form of ownership, not a... Uh, it, it sort of, you know, I, I've heard the phrase uh, uh, data mining, it's data and it's mine. Um, well, no, <laughs> it, it's the company's data, but who's got the custodial role around it? We don't have these questions and arguments about who's responsible for the money of the company. Oh, that's finance, we all know that. We, we may not love them and we may have uh, opportunities working with them, but we know where to go when it's a finance asset that you need to deal with and discuss. We know where to go when it's a personnel issue or an HR staffing question. We, those are clearly defined assets and they have organizational homes. Where does information live and who's responsible for it? So we've got to work out which of the assets, if any, are actually the, the direct responsibility of EIM. And I think many companies will find it's quite easy to locate some of their domains of information with having stewardship or custodianship uh, in the business lines, which are closest to them. Product data is pretty easy. Uh, facilities data belongs to your um, property management organization. But when you get to something like customer that may be a shared asset across everybody, 
uh, that's a more challenging problem. So think about does EIM actually need to take direct ownership of some of the data, and if so, how do they do that? Um, and, and as said earlier, I think the common denominator at the moment around EIM is governance. So uh, that's definitely uh, an area which is a whole discipline in and of itself, and there are whole conferences on governance. So um, that, that's something that we need to be building capability around. Um, I've touched on this, and uh, I need to be careful not to run out of time. So just quickly, how do you tackle all of these variables I'm throwing at you? And that is actually my intent, is more to leave you going out going, oh, God, this is horrible. How do I sort it all out? But that's important for you to have that feeling so you don't jump to an easy answer and then miss all the significance about what you could be doing with an EIM program. Um, so how do you scale it back to make it successful? There's a solution of starting at a line of business or a shared function. Um, take something like your budget process and make that the focus of your enterprise information management program with the dimensions you've chosen for it um, because that's probably going to go across multiple areas of your company and seed your approaches into those divisions. Start getting some people familiar with how to handle better quality data, what it means to have metadata available, and so forth. Um, at Bank of America, our approach is actually more around key data, which we have taken from solving an urgent need. And I've put the example of risk reporting, and it's a format of that. Most people probably are aware that banks are required to do capitalization reporting by Basel formulas, which came out of uh, Basel II Accords back golly, about 10 years ago now. Um, so we have to accumulate masses of data to demonstrate our capital position um, and, and report it out to our regulators at the national level and also internationally or by international formulae. We are taking the key elements of data necessary for that reporting and applying our standards and policies to those. And again, that means we're seeding knowledge about how to tackle the um, data management space by using that subset as our leading edge of getting into all the organizational areas that um, are responsible for those data elements. So um, th there's, there's various ways. Another aspect is to just choose one of the capabilities, like we'll have metadata for the majority of our uh, information, or we'll do data quality better across the majority of our information. So th there's different ways you can cut that to uh, get, get progress. Um, but through this, I mean, to the point that was made earlier, you're trying to establish uh, your identity and credibility as an organization so that you can start to climb that ladder of getting influence in the organization. Um, so key elements of this are also the communication, education, and influence that you're trying to build as you do this work. Um, touched on this a little bit, where does EIM report? Um, Traditionally, it very often grows up into the technology organization, and that's a nice, comfortable home. But the dangers are that you just become another part of the technology group. You may have some success, but you probably also garner some of the uh, epithets that can go with the technology organization. Uh, they're unresponsive. They live off in their own world and those kinds of things. Um, Finance might be a, a place. Um, normally, I think this now is getting rejected, but they do have the experience of managing a virtual asset, which is what our data problem is. But it's not going to be their primary focus, so it's not a particularly good place to go. Um, if you do have an enterprise CIO, hopefully external to your technology organization, this is a slight challenge for us at Bank of America because our CIO reports back into the same division as our technology uh, area, not directly under them, but in alignment. Um, but that gives them more autonomy, and so they become an equal weight partner with technology. That's very helpful, um, and uh, gives them a place to start establishing credibility, but that may be more difficult to do. Uh, the preferred and, and end game for us, I think, is trying to get to where you have the executive responsible for enterprise information assets reporting to your CEO or COO, just like your CFO does or your head of HR. This says that they've got the empowerment, independence, and recognition of the significance of their function, um, but this is a maturity scale that most of us are still climbing. Um, this would also help obviate our funding challenges and our capacity challenges. 
So things to think about. Um, I'm getting a little tight on time, so we're going to increase the speed of the gallop. Think about where else your organization needs to integrate with. You're going to have boundaries with lots of other organizations, your business units, technology, um, risk compliance, those types of interfaces. And a way to um, think about what that means is to actually do a RACI chart. Um, this is, you know, do not try this at home. This is not an accurate RACI. Um, it is de derived from one I'd done a couple years ago and condensed down with some columns taken out to make it fit and be, still be legible. So it's not quite accurate, but think about who has what role. And by doing a RACI, this is important for two reasons. It helps you identify the boundaries between the groups that you need to have participating, and it helps you clarify the skills you need. And I think those are two very important things. And I think those are murky things very often when we're doing these new programs. So just a recommendation. And my slides are one step out of order right here, so just backing up. And I apologize, they're out of sequence in your handout, so they must have got flipped when I sent my submission in and I didn't realize it. Um, the benefits, this is lined up against the earlier slide. What are the kinds of things you're going to try and uh, deliver that will help you improve the overall positioning of your information and be of value to your company? These are the beginnings of the things that you might use to help make a, a, a benefit argument and uh, a funding argument for your functions. Again, it helps if you can tie them back to what was your presenting problem and opportunity. So I think this analysis and thinking about all these dimensions of the problem space really is significant to helping be successful so you can demonstrate that you're making progress. Um, there are other soft benefits that you get by building an enterprise information management function. It just highlights the importance of treating data and information as significant resources for your organization. Um, it can help um, improve your data management practices. Uh, you can start to finally get insight on what is it that we have here that we're trying to manage um, and uh, drive the data governance processes. Um, getting the right metrics and dashboards is how you actually get executive presence and visibility, but keep them simple. Don't measure 200 things, measure five. Um, absolutely, I, I mean, that's actually a fallacy that my company is running into and I try and help give them guidance on. People care more about four significant numbers than that eye chart with 80 rows on it. Um, it can help you see where you can get efficiency saves and uh, it, it gives you the chance to build your skills. So closing thoughts, EIM is not new. The first EIM organization I was associated with uh, was formed 15 years ago. It encountered one of the problems here that I highlight. It was too close to the technology organization. It was supporting the data warehouse. 10 years later, it was back in technology and it had got subsumed back. So be careful of that. Remember that EIM is there to be the advocate for the information in the business. Um, and um, it doesn't have to be as complicated as I'm making it sound here, but think about these dimensions of the problem. The other big message I want you to take away is we need people with the right skills. Um, so it's complex and controversial. We are actually just starting on the road through the information age. The industrial age that started with the industrial revolution was about 120 to 150 years long. We've been doing this stuff in the data space maybe for 25 or 30 years. We've been using computers for 50. So we think that we have solved it and we're only just starting down the road. So um, remember that, that at, although it's complex and challenging, it's got a lot of value. We're aiming to get to where every company has an information division just like they have a finance division. And we have a known set of parameters that go with that. People know how to interface with it and we know what we do there and we've got to find jobs and skills just like CPAs. We want certified data analysts, certified data architects, information architects, governance people. Let's go for it and make this a great profession where we can have enterprise information management. Thank you.